We are in the book of Mark in the New Testament as a church going through the gospel of Mark and arriving this morning at chapter 4 where we're actually moving along. At some point it probably seemed we would not get out of chapter 1 and here we are, chapter 4. Uh, but people asking, what child is this? Who is this man that is healing people, that is forgiving people's sins? And as you're turning to Mark chapter 4 this morning, by the way, um, if you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to use and to take one of the Bibles that's in the seat back in front of you and keep it for yourself. Um, We have a huge high priority on hearing, preaching, studying, understanding, interacting over God's Word at this church because that is how, as we are going to see in our verses this morning, we change and become more like Him. Uh, So grab that Bible if you want to. The page number for those Bibles is on the screen for Mark 4. But as you're turning there, I want to let you know two things very quickly that are upcoming. The, The first is this coming Sunday in a week is our congregational meeting after this second service at noon ish, as soon as we can get started. And the purpose of this meeting is to approve nominations, names that have been put forward to serve as elders, deacons, and deaconesses. Those are the people in the church, some of the people, again, not all of the people, but just some of the roles of serving the body and helping the body grow and move toward Christ. Um, And so those names are going to be um, voted on and approved hopefully. And uh, what I wanted to let you know is that those names are available to be looked at out um, on the information desk. You can grab a list of those names on your way out. And the idea there is that you would come next week prepared. Not that you just have these names brought to you next week and say, I guess, I guess that's good. Um, and the same thing you'll also find out there, which we're also looking to approve next week, is our budget for 2019, which is, I know some of you just got really excited and your heart started racing. <laughs> Now, probably some of you did because you have a gift in that area, yeah. Um, But anyway, it is exciting. The more I've looked at the numbers and talked with people and prayed um, to think about how much that represents what God is doing and what we see him continuing to do at the church. So you can also grab a copy of that out there, the proposed budget, and look at those numbers before next week. The second thing is Christmas Eve. Just wanted to let you know we have two services on Christmas Eve, 5 and 7 o'clock. Same service, two times, so you can choose whichever is best for you and your family or your friends. But I do want to encourage you to bring somebody. Invite somebody to come along. They're going to have our Congolese friends up here singing with us. um, And we're going to preach the gospel, which I hope you hear the gospel every week. The gospel being that Jesus Christ is our righteousness. He is our hope. We don't arrive at that by our works. Uh, But that will be a wonderful time to celebrate and remember Jesus together. Well, with that, we're going to get into Mark 4. Before we do that, though, I would like us to pray a prayer together um, that will be very obvious why we're doing this once we begin reading Mark chapter 4. But the prayer is this, Lord, give me ears to hear your word. If we could put that up on the screen. Lord, give me ears to hear your word. Would you pray that with me right now? Lord, give me ears to hear your word. Lord, that is our prayer. Um, We could sit here and and listen and have sounds sort of go into our natural ears but completely miss what you want to say to us. So we are asking, Lord, that you would open up our hearts, open our eyes, our ears to see, to hear, to listen to your voice today, knowing that it is your desire, your will, that we would hear you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mark chapter 4. We're going to read a large chunk today, so you can like situate yourself a little, get a little comfortable. Um, And you're going to see why in just a second. These all flow together. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Again, he, Jesus, began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. So let's picture that. Jesus, the crowd is getting so big that Jesus eventually has to get into a boat, push away from land a little bit in order to teach the crowd. This was also a really smart acoustic decision. Those of you who have been on a lake and there's somebody out in a boat and you can hear everything they're saying, whether or not they want you to or not. Um, And so this is a good move on Jesus' part to be out there speaking in to the people who are on the land. And in verse 2, he is teaching them. It says he's teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. 
Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? And then he explains it to them. Verse 14, the sower sows the word. And, and there are those along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? So nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Verse 26, Jesus sort of expounds now on this parable of the sower. He says, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain. And when the grain is ripe at once, he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Finally, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. And we'll stop there. As I said, that is a huge chunk of Scripture. And the reason for that is because I want us to see this morning the common thread that is running throughout these stories Jesus is telling. Obviously, we're going to look a little bit at, at these parables, but what I want us to see more importantly is this central theme of the Word. The Word of God, which is described both as light that is put up on a stand for all to see, but more often in these verses, it is described as seed that is being scattered, being thrown and scattered throughout the countryside. And the seed is bringing about what? The kingdom of God, which starts out so tiny as this little seed in the human heart, but ends up this worldwide kingdom. But as we look at this these verses, these stories, the seed is scattered around, but we see that there are lots of different responses to the word. Lots of different responses. Some have no fruit. There's no response. There's no evidence that there was ever seed there. 
and others have lots of fruit. What we're going to look at today is the difference between those two. But as we think about these parables, I want us to notice, just zooming out a little on Mark, a huge shift in Jesus' teaching style with his use of parables. Because if you look at verse 2, it tells us right away, Jesus was teaching them many things in parables. Okay, fair enough. But then you look at the last verse we read. Verse 34 says, He did not speak to them without a parable. I want you to imagine that. Imagine if I only spoke in parables. So instead of we have Christmas Eve services, I say there was a man and he was traveling on a road called December and, and he was heading for the town of Eve just before the town of Christmas. You know, you'd, you'd be like, stop it, right? <laughs> just tell us what you're trying to say. We have a Christmas Eve service. But Jesus is speaking in, in parables and this is a huge shift. And a parable, by the way, means to put two things alongside each other. That's what that Greek root means, para, means alongside. And so the idea is he's taking an earthly anecdote, an earthly story, in order to illustrate a spiritual truth or reality. And we see that very clearly in this. And in fact, you've probably already noticed this style in Jesus' teaching throughout Mark. For example, when he came to his first followers and he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now picture the literal version of that. People swimming around in the water and getting hooks caught in their mouth, right? It's like, okay, well that, that can't be what he means. But you notice Jesus didn't say, follow me and I will turn you into an evangelist who will tell people about God so they'll believe in me. He just said, I'll make you fishers of men. We see this style again when he's talking about fasting and Sabbath. He, he says if a person doesn't sew a piece of unshrunk cloth on, on clothing, and, and then he's talking about wineskins and pouring wine into light. It's not about wine. It's not about clothing. So he already has this style, but as we can see, this is a huge step up in this because he says, I am now only speaking to the crowds in parables. And the question, I think, a really great question is, Why? Why would Jesus now start doing this? I think the first clue we get, for me at least, is in verse 9 of chapter 4. It says after um, he tells the parable of the sower, he says something that shows up eight or so times in the Gospels, almost as a, a quote. Whoever has ears to hear, what does it say? Let him hear. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Now Jesus is not saying, I don't believe, that there were people in the crowd who had no ears, who, who had that part of their head covered over with skin, right? Jesus is saying that there are some in the crowd who are tuned in to what he's saying. There are some whose spiritual senses are awakened to the reality that he is talking about. And there are some who are not. There are some who, as Isaiah says, their ears are heavy. Their hearts are dull. Their eyes are blind. They can't see. And, and Jesus is saying, if you can hear this, hear this. If you can't, don't. Now that might seem insensitive. That might almost seem as if Jesus doesn't care about those who can't hear. But we have to remember here, of course, Jesus is not trying to exclude certain people. We know that Jesus wants all people to be saved. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved, who? The world. Everybody, every nation, every people group, every person, man, woman, child, he loves them all. And this is what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, that God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Amen? That's the gospel. He's not playing favorites. He's not choosing here. But if we remember the first three chapters in Mark, where we've been for the last several weeks, we know that there are people in this crowd to whom he is telling these stories who hate him. People who have rejected him. They resist him. They're actually just plotting a way to kill him. That's it. And those people are out in the crowd. And when you think about what we've already seen so far in Mark, who is Jesus spending most of his time interacting with? Those people. He, he's... He's obviously spending time with his disciples, but we constantly see every teaching. There's a Pharisee there. There's a scribe there arguing with him. And meanwhile, guess who's also there in the crowd? People who want to know more about God. People with a hunger for Jesus. People to, who, who are there to say, tell me more, Jesus. But guess what? 
They're, they're just waiting for their turn <laughs> with Jesus. They're waiting for the arguments to stop so they can ask him some honest, genuine, sincere questions. And so I think that this, this turn to parables is Jesus' way of sort of sifting the crowd. He is now beginning to separate the crowd into those who have no interest in the truth, no interest in following him. They're just trying to stop him. They're just trying to trip him up. They're trying to interrupt him. And there are those who really genuinely want to follow Jesus. And so Jesus is employing this thing called a parable to sort of do this with the crowd and separate. And we see it works perfectly in verse 10. When he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, those who have thought I was probably just out of my mind as I was talking about seed and all of that, everything is in parables. They're just stories. So that they may indeed see but not perceive. They may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Now, if you were to just take that last verse and say, let's build theology on that and not understand the context, you'd be in big trouble. Because there is a sense here in which it seems that Jesus is trying to keep people from being forgiven. Isn't that what it sounds like? I'm telling parables so that they don't understand, they don't perceive, lest they should turn and be forgiven. But Remember last week we talked about how we have to let Scripture interpret Scripture. In other words, what is going on not just here in Mark, but where do these words come from? By the way, where do these words come from? Yeah, Isaiah. Jesus is quoting in front of these experts of the Old Testament, an Old Testament prophet verse. He is quoting, which they would have understand perfectly well, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10. And if you go, speaking of context, Isaiah has its own context. And if you read the first five chapters of Isaiah leading up to this verse that Jesus pulls out and quotes, the whole context is God saying to Isaiah, the prophet, I want you to keep preaching the truth to these people even though they have rejected your message. I want you to keep teaching and keep preaching even though they have hardened their hearts to what I have to say to them. That's the context, and the scribes would have known that perfectly well. An example of this, it's all over in Isaiah 1 through 5. I'm just going to give you a few short little lines. Right away in Isaiah 1 verse 4, it says, They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. Now, who is referred to as the Holy One in Mark? Jesus. Interesting. Here is Jesus before Bethlehem. And they're rejecting him. Even back in Isaiah's day, it says they have rejected, they have despised him. The very next verse in Isaiah 1 verse 5, God says, why do you continue to rebel? In other words, I'm trying to reach you. You don't want to be reached. And then again in verse 19 of chapter 1, he says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. In other words, I am trying and over and over in the next five chapters, we see the same thing, them rejecting, resisting. And it culminates in chapter 5 with verse 24 where it says, They have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Now, if that does not describe what is going on in Mark, I don't know what does. They have rejected, this group of people has rejected Jesus. They've despised His word. Meaning, it's being scattered and sown all over. <laughs> and they are literally knocking it off of them. I don't want anything to do with that word. I don't want that seed. I don't want that to bear any fruit in my life. So they're rejecting that. And so the reality and the point of all of this is that Jesus isn't telling parables in order to exclude people, but because they have already excluded themselves. He's not telling them to, to blind people to the truth, but because there were some who were already blind to the truth. In fact, one theologian says something fascinating. He said, Jesus didn't tell parables to blind people, but to make them look again. To make them look again, he's trying to draw them. He's trying to make them curious. At least ask a question. But this is what is going on, and Jesus is telling this parable, and we see that there were those who were open and responsive. Those who were closed moved on. Those who were open and responsive, verse 10 when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And what did he say to them? To you has been given the secret 
of the kingdom of God. What does that mean? What is he talking about there? I think it's, first of all, good to acknowledge there's a, there's a secret. There is a mystery. It's not this obvious thing because Jesus came and saying, what did he say? The kingdom of God is, say it, at hand. It's right here. Here's the kingdom of God. Now, that would be like me coming in this room and saying, uh, uh, there's a Hawaii beach right here, and it's the ocean, and it's 75, and the sun, and you guys would be thinking, you're crazy, or tell me what you mean. I'd love to get in on some 75 sun right now. Amen? Okay. But you see, there'd be something secret about that. There'd, there'd be a mystery to it. You'd be like, okay, what do you mean? Tell me more. And that is exactly what these people are doing. And he says, to you has been given the secret. What a thrilling thing to hear Jesus say. I think it's awesome. He doesn't say, you're getting warmer. <laughs> it's not like a game of charades. You're, you're, you're close. He says, you've got it. You've got it. Big, the big question is, what is it? What, what is it that they have? What is the secret? Now, I had a couple options that came to mind for me this week. The first thing that popped into my mind, it could be that the disciples had this supernatural ability to understand all of the parables. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying when he was saying it. Is that the case, though? No, not at all. Because they come and ask him, what, what does that mean, Jesus? In fact, this is like Groundhog Day throughout Mark. Over and over, they keep coming back to Jesus. Jesus I don't know. So what are you talking about here? In fact, in Mark chapter 8, which we'll get to eventually, after Jesus feeds the 4,000, he's talking to them about some stuff. And just long story short, they're not getting it. And Jesus says this to his disciples. Mark 8, 17. Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? Interesting. Almost exactly the wording that he uses with the Pharisees and the scribes, but with his disciples. In other words, they're, they're not getting it. It's, it's not the secret to the parable. In other words, that was given to them. It's the secret to the kingdom. Another option of what this secret could be is that Jesus gave exclusive access to these 12 disciples. You guys are the ones who can come ask me questions. Everybody else is out. But that's not it. Because look at verse 10. When he was alone, who was around him? Those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. How many people are there? No idea. Could have been 20, could have been 50, could have been 100, 200. We don't know. It was the people who stuck around. It was those who stayed close. The other people moved on. But these people wanted to know what Jesus meant. And it's at this point, after they asked Jesus, what does that mean that he says, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom? Now friends, we could spend a lot more time on this, but I believe the secret of the kingdom is that the word that was sown in these people was bearing fruit already. It was working. There was curiosity. There was a sense of, I want to know more. And the evidence of this is that they come asking questions. They, they're still with Jesus. They weren't satisfied to say, well, that's a lovely bedtime story. <laughs> I'll tell that one to my kids tonight. No, they were like, what does he mean? I want to know more. I want to press in. And eventually they got the nerve to say, Jesus, what are you talking about? And notice before Jesus tells them anything about the parable, he says, you've got it. <laughs> I love that. Before he even tells them what the parable means, he says, you've got the secret. Now, I think what he's saying there is it's less important that I give you the answer to the parable than the fact that you're asking the question. That is it. That is the secret of the kingdom. I could not help but think this week of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, which many of you will recognize. He says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. You could almost say this with me. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. To the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Now, I've always heard those verses, and I've always thought of those as sort of synonyms of each other. You know, ask, seek, knock, search, go on a journey. It doesn't really matter. He's just picking words, basically saying if you look for it, you'll find it. But 
I began thinking about these words this week in light of the kingdom, in light of wanting to know what is the kingdom, Jesus? You keep talking about it being at hand. What is it? How do I get there? Because you think of now, in light of Mark chapter 3 and 4, there's a progression taking place. If, I, if Jesus comes to earth and he says, the kingdom of God is here, what's the first thing you do if you don't have any idea what he's talking about? Ask. Jesus, what? What do you mean? He begins to talk a little bit about what the kingdom is, repentance and forgiveness of sins, and, and you'll have a new life, and you're going to leave behind the old, and you know, he's kind of giving you hints, and what do you begin to do as you get a picture of the kingdom? Seek. You go looking for that kingdom, if you want to use a ge geographical metaphor. You go searching. You say, how do I get there? What is that like? You seek for it. You, now listen, this is really critical, I think. You begin arranging the priorities of your life around the reality of this kingdom. The priorities of your life. What do you do when you get out of bed in the morning? How you spend your free time, how you spend time with your family is arranged around this search for God. And what is the final thing you do? You're searching for the kingdom. You finally arrive at this beautiful city with this big gate. What do you do? <laughs> Knock. <laughs> I'm here. Can I come in? And what does Jesus say at every single one of those things? Ask. It'll be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and I'll open up the door to you. You found it. The secret, you have it. And I believe the secret is this hunger. It's this desire for more. It's, it's this progression of growth. It is responding to the word that is sown in us. That's the secret of growth. Respond to the seed. Don't do nothing. Ask questions. Seek. Find. We never settle. We never stop. We never get bored. We never sit back and think, well, I've already read Mark 4 so many times. I'm just going to check my phone. Anybody done that? I've done that. Oh, yeah, no, I, I know that. What am I doing next week? And we tune it out, and we think, I've arrived. I've made it. I've got nothing more to learn. These people were not there. They were wanting more of Jesus. And so they were pressing into him. And I think of the family last week trying to get to Jesus. Jesus is these group of people out around him and they're asking questions. He's talking to them and then his family's outside. Jesus, we need to get to Jesus. And the crowd's like, Jesus, go talk to your family. We'll, we'll part. We'll let you out. You go talk to your family. And what does Jesus say? You're my family. You're the people I came for because you are the people who care. You're the people who want to know about the kingdom of God. You've got it. This is the secret. You've got it. Another perfect example of this in the Bible is Mary and Martha. I feel like that gets used a lot. Sometimes Martha gets a bad rap. But she's pretty rad because in Luke chapter 10, Martha is the one who invited Jesus over to the house. I think Martha has the gift of hospitality. And she has Jesus over, and Jesus comes over, and then Martha's like, you know, busy. She's, she's doing the meal, and she's setting the table, and she's dusting off the furniture. I, I don't know if you did that. That'd be a constant job, I suppose, back then. But... She's working, she's busy, and she starts to get irritated. Why? Because Mary, her sister, is sitting there doing nothing except listening to Jesus. And so rather than Martha talking to Mary, Martha actually commands Jesus to tell her sister to help her. <laughs> Jesus, tell my sister to help me. And, and Jesus, oh, he loves Martha. She's sweet. He says something really shocking in, in verse 41 of Luke 10. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. I think there's significance to two Marthas there. <laughs> Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Can anyone relate to that right there? You're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen what is best, which will not be taken away from her. Now, does that mean that we don't have to prepare meals? No. Or get out of bed in the morning or get dressed and go to our job. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that all of the work, all of the serving, the plans, the programs, they're going to go away. But what will never be taken away? <laughs> the Word of God and the relationship we have with Him. That is the one thing that can never be taken away from Mary. Your house is going to burn. It's going to go away. All of your stuff is going to go away. 
Whatever titles or reputation is going to go away, what can never be taken away is this. You receiving the seed and the word and responding to it and thinking about it and wanting more of it. That's the only thing that's going to bear fruit beyond this life. That is what Jesus is saying to her, and that, I believe, is the secret. Mary had it. Mary had the secret. And I want to just quickly touch on this sower parable, the sower, the parable of the sower and the seed, and how all of these parables relates to this secret. And I was sort of worried this week we weren't going to have time to go in depth into all these parables, but I thought, oh, what a good opportunity to practice the secret to practice for us to go home and look at them for ourselves and say, Jesus, what does this mean? Talk to me. But Jesus leads out with this parable of the sower. And in this parable, how many types of soil are there? Four types of soil. And these types of soil represent four different responses to the seed or the word that is being spoken. And I want us to notice, first of all, that there was one thing that all of these soils had in common. First of all, somebody came up and pointed out, Micah, there's actually two things. The first is that they're all dirt. <laughs> they're all soil. They're all, they're all soil. They're, they're all dirt. But the other thing that they all have in common is every one of them heard the word. Every one of them had the seed sown and scattered and cast into their life. The difference wasn't in their access to the truth, but in their response to the truth. And we see this, I could not help but think this morning of everybody sitting here, including me. We're all hearing the word, but there will be all kinds of responses leaving this place, won't there? I pray we all respond and we produce fruit and we come back next week different people, but some won't. And that's what Jesus is saying. And what I want to point out here in Jesus' parable, there are three obstacles to a good response to the word. Three obstacles to a good response. The first obstacle is for those who are uh, seed that was scattered along the path. And it says for these people that Satan, in verse 14, immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Now think of this obstacle as the devil, our enemy, who hates it when people hang around Jesus. He hates it when people hear from Jesus. He hates it when people have a priority in their life of opening up their Bible and saying, God, speak to me. He hates that. And if, even if God does speak, he's like, all right, now I've got to do whatever I can to squash that. I've got to take that away. I've got to distract them. I've got to discourage them so that no fruit comes from that moment. That's what Jesus is saying here. It's an obstacle that we are to be aware of. The next obstacle is this other group that is sown in rocky soil. And this is describing those who hear the word and receive it with joy. What a, what a picture. Yay, I'm so excited. But they don't have any root. And so when tribulation and persecution and difficulty comes into their life, what happens? They fall away. I thought of this this week, guys, that, that when we come to Jesus, I know... We've all had this tendency to think that Jesus is leading us into this path of, of, of comfort and pleasure. And it's almost like the road we're walking on with him will end at this like Caribbean cruise. <laughs> and it's going to be just this awesome thing. But when we're walking with him and we come around the corner and rather than a cruise, we see a cross. We think that's not what I signed up for. I accepted you, Jesus, so you could make my life better and easier. Not so I could suffer. And so many people, because there is no root in them, fall away. The final obstacle, though, is the seed that is sown among thorns. Those who hear the word, but the what? The cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches. By the way, right there, you could have a whole sermon on that. The deceitfulness of riches. Money is the answer to my problem. Money is what will satisfy my heart. Deceit. The deceitfulness of riches and what? The desire for other things. Enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. I think it'd be valuable for us this morning to just have an opportunity to acknowledge and respond. Who can relate to that? Raise your hand. 
As I prayed through that and thought about that this week, here's how I think of this in my life. It is the slow, systematic loss of appetite for the kingdom of God because I am so consumed with the kingdom of the world. It's because I am feasting on so many things of the world's values and the world system that I am slowly losing my appetite to sit at the feet of Jesus and say, tell me more. Can anyone relate to that? I think if we're honest, all of us struggle with that. All of us are deceived by riches. We're deceived by the values of the world. Deceived into thinking that the answer is out there somewhere. But this gets then to the last group of people who hear the word. Remember, they all hear the word. But these people accept it. They, they prioritize their life around it. They say, I'm gonna, there's going to be some change here because of what I've just heard. And then they begin to what? Bear fruit. That's the whole point. They change. And that is exactly what we talk about at Mac. This is the life-changing grace of Jesus. That means is I'm not the same as I used to be. I'm not the same as I was after I heard that message, after I read that scripture. I'm, I'm different. But I want to encourage you guys this morning that none of us is destined to stay where we are. You are not destined to stay where you are. You may be sitting here this morning and thinking, I'm probably rocky soil. I'm probably the thorn one. And I guess I'm just not destined to be fruitful. That's not the case. In fact, if you think of these parables, I probably go through these parables, all of them, on a daily or weekly basis. Would you imagine? Like you're reading the Bible and you're distracted by the cares of the world. And the seed that is kind of going, it's kind of like flying past me. It doesn't bear fruit for me that day because I'm not paying close attention. And so I want to encourage us today that God has provided a way for us to become good soil. And as we close, I just want to share the two things from these parables that I think we have to remember and we have to take with us if we are going to change, if we're going to grow. The first thing we see in these parables is that only God can bring growth. Could you say that with me, please? Only God can bring growth. Notice that Jesus did not say to his disciples, you figured out the secret. What did he say? To you has been given the secret. What does that mean? That means even the desire, even the smallest seed of desire to know Jesus comes from who? You can say it. God, yeah. Comes from God. All growth comes from God. And look at verse 26. This is where this comes from. He said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. What a cool line. <laughs> he has no idea what's going on. And what that means is there is a mystery to our growth as Christians, and that mystery is God. You ever think about the fact that the secret to growth is in the seed? A farmer can plant the seed. A farmer can water. A farmer can weed. Pharma can work in all kinds of ways, but how a little seed in dirt becomes tasty, edible food, we have no clue. Hmm. Right? Science can tell us what, they can't tell us why. They don't know why, but we know why. God is the only one who brings growth. And that physical reality translates, like a parable, into the spiritual reality of our growth as people. And Paul says exactly this in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, I planted, meaning I came and gave you the word. I sowed the word. Apollos, this other guy, watered. In other words, water. Apollos stuck around, helped them learn the word, helped them grow. But what? God gave the growth. <laughs> so then, and here's Paul's like accommodation of himself, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. Whew but only God who gives the growth. <laughs> what a cool thing. What a, what a hopeful reality that, that I am nothing up here. I'm scattering seed. I'm, I'm nothing. The only one who matters is God who takes that seed and even while we're sleeping <laughs> causes change to happen. Hallelujah. And this truth, this reality should protect us from pride. There's this ditch over here. 
I think there's two ditches. We'll get to the other one in just a second. The ditch of pride. I have to go out and muscle my way. I got to be a better person. I got to make myself that. No, that's pride. That's the opposite of the gospel. You can't. You won't. We'll fail every time if we think it's about us. This reminds us it is only God who can do that work. If I want more desire, I ask God for more desire. And then I do something with that desire. But just as soon as we realize there's a ditch of pride and we embrace this truth that's on the screen, we sometimes move over here and fall into a ditch called passiveness. We hear this truth and we say, oh, God, God does it. Cool, so you get to just enjoy the American dream now. You get to just sit back and relax because God will make you whatever you're supposed to be and one day you'll arrive in heaven and ta-da! That is not what Jesus teaches here. And I want to point out then the second truth before we close. Yes, it is only God who can bring growth, but it is only we who can receive the word. It is only we who can receive the word. And if that protects us against pride, number one, we are then protected against passiveness. Because Jesus says in verse 24 to his followers, he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. How's that? How many you ever heard that in school from your parents? Pay attention. Sit up. Listen. Don't, don't scroll through your phone, right? Listen to what you hear because the seed is being scattered. Posture yourself to receive and to respond because Jesus says, here's the promise. If we do that, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you for to the one who has more, uh, to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. In the context, what I read that to mean is if you want more desire, if you want more connection with Jesus, cultivate what little you have. Don't think about what you don't have, what you think you should have, what you wish you have. Look at what you have and do something with it. The one who has, more will be given. As you pursue Christ, you will expand in your ability to understand him and to know him. And the flip side of that is if you don't, if you do nothing with it, what? It's taken away. Jesus moves on to somebody who is interested. I want to have the worship team come forward as we close and our ushers to receive our benevolent offering. And as they come forward, let me pray for us. Pray with me, please. Jesus, we are, um, I just love what that person said after the first service. We're soil. We're dirt. The secret of growth is not in us. The secret of growth is in you. It is in your word that is sown into dirt. And then it is in our response to that word and paying attention to that word, Lord, that you do what only you can do. And we pray, God, that you, I just pray right now for everybody here in this room right now that we would be people who are hungry for you. People who are asking and we're seeking and we're knocking and we're not satisfied to sit back and say, I already know the answer to that but that we would forever be pressing into you, Jesus. Thank you. In your name we pray, amen.